Hi, Mr. Green here. In topic 2.3, we'll be exploring flows of energy and matter through an ecosystem. Much of the information in here will be linked back to our topic in 1.3 on energy and equilibrium. We need to understand that ecosystems are maintained by the flow of energy and matter, which also link different systems together. The primary source of energy for life on Earth is the sun, and this energy drives ecosystems. Pause at this point, make sure that you have your study guide, and be ready to take your notes. Our significant ideas for this topic are that interactions of species within their environment results in energy and nutrient flows. Photosynthesis and respiration play a significant role in the flow of energy in ecosystems and the feeding relationships of species in a system can be modeled using food chains, food webs, and ecological pyramids. Our big questions are as follows. Please make sure that you're looking at these to help guide you through this topic. Our understanding statements are as follows. Again, please make sure that you pause, go through these as a guide to help you with your primary understandings for this topic. You will also want to cue in to the guidance. This will help you in key concepts and ideas within each one of the statements. We have three applications for this topic and three skills. We will be focusing on these both in class as well as in case studies. As you remember, in topic 1.3, the first law of thermodynamics states that energy can be transferred and transformed, but not created or destroyed. This means that energy flow in the biological world is unidirectional. Sun energy enters the system and replaces energy lost from heat. Energy at one tropic level is always less than the previous level due to entropy. In the second law of thermodynamics, we see that energy transformations proceed spontaneously to convert matter from a more ordered, less stable form to a less ordered, more stable form. Energy is lost as heat from each level. Energy at one level is less than the previous level because of these losses due to our entropy. Pause the video and identify the inputs, outputs, flows, storages, transfers, and transformations. Light from the sun is the source of energy for life on our planet. Light that enters the atmosphere consists of a range of wavelengths known as the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible spectrum is just part of this range of wavelengths that we can perceive with our eyes. Other wavelengths, such as the short wavelength X-rays and ultraviolet radiation and much longer infrared and radio waves, cannot be detected by the human eye. No matter what the wavelength or the electromagnetic wave, they can all be reflected or refracted. This has important consequences within ecosystems. About 30% of the energy reaching the Earth's surfaces is reflected back into space from clouds, ice, snow, water, and land. This is known as the albedo effect. A further 69% is absorbed. Land and sea absorb some of the energy and is heated. Less than 2% of the sun's energy is available to plants. Note that the width of the arrow are proportional to the volume that is reflected, absorbed, and scatter. Energy for our ecosystem all comes from sunlight. Only 2% of the light energy falling on the plant is used to create energy. The rest is reflected or just warms up the plant as it is absorbed. Only a very small fraction of the light from the sun that does reach green plants is eventually converted to biomass. About 90% of the sunlight is reflected by clouds in the albedo. 9% reflected from the ground, 3% scattered by the atmosphere. 69% of the incoming solar radiation is, is absorbed by the Earth, 94% by land and water, 
17 by molecules, 3% by clouds. The light that reaches the leaf may be reflected from the surface of the leaf or pass through them without being captured. Chlorophyll only captures certain wavelengths of light for the use of photosynthesis. Green reflects, red and blue absorbs. Photosynthesis has inbuilt inefficiencies and is limited by factors such as temperature and carbon dioxide concentrations that the rate at which enzyme catalysts can work. Even light that does enter leaves may not strike the chloroplast. Measurements show that less than 0.05% of the light energy falling on the earth is captured by plants and converted into biomass. While scattering could send the light in any direction, reflection will send it back out into space. The most reflective aspects of our atmosphere are clouds, which can reflect between 40 and 90% of the incoming light. The reflectivity of the surface is called the albedo. Dark colors have a low albedo, while light colors have a much higher one. Pause at this point and identify and discuss the human use components of the diagram on your left. The pathways of energy through an ecosystem will include conversion or transformation of light energy to chemical energy. The transfer of chemical energy from one tropic level to another with varying efficiencies. Overall conversion or transformation of ultraviolet and visible light to heat energy by an ecosystem. And the re-radiation of heat energy to the atmosphere, another transfer. Biomass is a mass of living organisms in a given area expressed as dry weight or mass per unit area or meters squared. Dry weight is the weight of mass of an organism with all of the water removed. Pause the video at this point and look at the graph on the right. Identify the areas with the greatest amount of above ground biomass. State why these areas have high biomass. As humans, we continue to look for methods to help harness solar radiation. However, we have to rely on plants to convert solar radiation into biomass that all animals can eat. Productivity is the conversion of energy into biomass over a given period of time. It is the rate of growth or biomass increase in both plants and animals. The chemical energy in the molecules of glucose and stored compounds is available to consumers, but not all of that energy is transferred. Whenever consumers eat energy, it is transferred from one trophic level to another, but 90% is lost through respiration, feces, and other waste products. This is known as ecological efficiency. One consequence of this is that the biomass at the higher tropic levels is almost less than at the lower tropic levels, as shown in pyramids of energy and biomass. The details of the pathway of energy flow in an ecosystem depends on the organism and on the characteristics of that ecosystem. Most of the primary production of a, tropic, of a tropical rainforest will enter the decomposed chain levels. But in a marine ecosystem, a far larger proportion will be passed through the consumer food chains. One intensively used agricultural land, more than 50% of primary productivity can enter the grain food chain. Energy efficiency is calculated by looking at the energy used for growth times the new biomass divided by energy supply times 100. There are two types of productivity. Primary, which is productivity from our autotrophs or our plants, and secondary, this is productivity from our heterotrophs or animals. Primary productivity is the production of chemical energy in organic compounds by autotrophs. It is usually measured as biomass per unit area per unit time. Primary productivity in rainforests is high because there is an ample resource of sunlight, water, nutrients, and temperature. 
Primary production is low in deserts because the necessity of resources are scarce. Primary productivity will be either gross or net and usually measured for the whole tropic level. Gross primary productivity is a theoretical amount of biomass or oxygen produced by photosynthesis. All of the biomass produced by primary producers is given in amount of time before any of it is used for respiration. This is very difficult to measure because glucose is used immediately in respiration and repair. Respiration is the amount of biomass or oxygen consumed during cellular respiration to keep the organism alive. Measurements used to establish net primary productivity vary and may involve sampling plant material and drying it to establish the biomass. These estimates are used when pyramids of biomass and energy are drawn. It is difficult to account for the productivity of every part of a plant, such as that by the roots, the amount that is eaten by herbivores, and leaves lost to leaf litter. So net primary productivity estimations are often too low. Estimates of respiration are gained from the amount of carbon dioxide produced and can be attained by measuring the concentration of the gas in the, in the atmosphere. Net primer, primary productivity is not very efficient. If you assume a plant receives 100 units of solar energy, 50 will be used because it is in the wrong wavelength. 5 will go through the leaf, 5 will be reflected. 40 units go into the leaf, only 30 units will be used for photosynthesis. The remaining 10 are used for biomass or lost in respiration. Plants and animals have to use some of the energy they capture to keep themselves growing. They both move water and store chemicals around. Plants make flowers, fruit, new leaves, cells, and stems. Animals create cells and they have the need to move muscles. Not all biomass is created equally. In terrestrial ecosystems, temperature, water availability, and solar radiation influences the rate of primary productivity. In aquatic systems, water is not the limiting factor. Temperature varies less in the ocean than on land because water has a high specific capacity. A measuring limiting factor in aquatic systems is light. The amount of biomass produced can vary spatially or temporally. Pause at this particular point, look at the graph on the right, and evaluate the global variation in net primary productivity. Like primary productivity, second productivity can be either gross or net and is measured for a whole trophic level. It measures both feeding or absorption of stored energy. When the productivity a consumer is considered, two losses are significant. First, loss in feces. Second, respiratory losses. Loss in feces occurs because animals do not or cannot use all the biomass that they eat. Feces contains food that cannot be digested by the animal. Respiratory loss is the energy that is assimilated, then used in respiration to maintain the animal's life processes. Pyramid structures and ecosystem functions all show these energy transfers. Net secondary productivity is the gain by consumers in energy or biomass per unit area per unit time remaining after allowing for respiratory losses. As with plants, not all energy that goes into the herbivore is available to make new biomass. Please note that the net secondary productivity is growth, which is corrected because net secondary productivity is what is left after other life processes have taken place. Pause at this particular point and complete the flowchart. Pause the video and compare the net primary productivity within a low nutrient supply and a high nutrient supply within an aquatic system. Pause the video at this point and evaluate the maximum net PPP in each of these biomes. Suggest why the primary productivity could be lower in some versus others. 
In a food web diagram, you can assume that energy input into an organism represents the gross productivity. Energy output from that organism to the next trophic level represents the net productivity. Therefore, we see that gross productivity minus net productivity equals respiration energy and or loss to decomposers. Pause at this point. The least productive ecosystems are those with limited heat and light energy, limited water and limited nutrients. Can you name an example of biome? The most productive ecosystems are those with high temperatures, lots of water, light and nutrients. Can you identify this biome? There are various ways to measure primary productivity. One, the harvest method. This is where we measure biomass and express as biomass per unit area per unit time. Also, carbon dioxide assimilation, measuring carbon dioxide uptake in photosynthesis and release by respiration. Oxygen production, measuring the oxygen production and consumption. Radioisotope method using carbon-14 tracers in photosynthesis and chlorophyll measurement where we assume a correlation between the amount of chlorophyll and the rate of photosynthesis. When showing our energy flows, we usually use quantitative models. Notice that a systems diagram does not involve pretty pictures for us to really understand what is going on. Therefore, whenever we take a look at flows of energy or flows of matter, we like to use quantitative data. Pause at this particular point and complete the energy flow diagram. Make sure that you label the gross primary productivity, the net primary productivity, and R for the primary producers. Okay. You will need to also make sure that you have appropriate arrows to show any missing energy flows. Then what you'll want to do is fill in the blank boxes to explain why some sunlight is not fixed by plants. Pause at this point and evaluate this quantitative model of flows of energy. Your first application is to analyze quantitative models of flows of energy. Take a look at the diagram on the right. There's a lot of data in this flow chart. What patterns do you see? How do the source and type of numbers impact an ecosystem? In application two, you need to analyze the efficiency of energy transfer through an ecosystem. Efficiency generally means you will have to calculate percentages. Pay attention to units as well. They may be required in an IB exam. Sustainable yield is the rate of increase in biomass that can be exploited without preventing the organism being taken from replenishing themselves. The relationship can be expressed in the equation sustainable yield equals the annual growth and recruitment minus the annual death and immigration. Forestry sustainable yield is the largest amount of wood that could be harvested without reducing the productivity of the remaining trees. Fishing sustainable yield is the amount of fish that can be caught on a regular basis without compromising the ability of the species to reproduce and maintain its population. Sustainable yield can vary over time with the needs of an ecosystem. For example, a forest fire will require more than its own productivity to sustain and establish a mature forest. While doing so, the sustainable yield may be much less than in previous years. Maximum sustainable yield is often used in terms of commercial production. Maximum sustainable yield is the largest amount of raw material that can be taken without permanently depleting the stock. The maximum sustainable yield has been exceeded in many of the world's fishing grounds, resulting in various attempts to return to a situation of sustainability. So let's take a look at an example of our maximum sustainable yield with lions in the Celos Game Reserve in Tanzania. The current population is about 1,000. This will be our natural capital or standing stock. The average, the average annual births are 78 and the average annual deaths are 48. So what we do is we see that the, nas the natural income is about 
30 lions per year. So in other words, this is our growth. Therefore, 30 tons per year may be hunted without decreasing the standard stock, the standing stock, or diminishing the lion population. However, this assumes that there are no fluctuations in the population. This also assumes that the optional sustainability yield is going to be about 50% of the maximum yield to account for any unknowns. This video comes from our previous course. However, it is very relevant. What I would like for you to do is to pause and watch the video and note the calculations performed for both GSP and NSP. We will be doing calculations like these in class. This concludes part one of topic 2.3. If you have any questions or would like additional information, please make sure that you reach out to me. Thank you and have a great day.